Well, okay. Welcome, everybody. And uh, thank you all for participating, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the eight members of the panel. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. But before we do that, I want to brief everybody about what is uh, Friday Conversations. Friday Conversations is a conversational group uh, of uh, started by Singaporeans. Uh, we are we were based in a, a, a restaurant in the last year. Uh, we ran a whole series of discussions over many, many topics. Uh, we are totally non-partisan politically, although we are very concerned about uh, the political uh, environment and political culture of Singapore, right? And indeed, uh, we are very, very concerned that uh, uh, Singaporeans should be much more informed about uh, life in Singapore as well as uh, in, in the surrounding areas. Um, tonight's uh, topic, uh, well, before I go there, let me just briefly explain what, what are the kinds of discussions we had before. For example, we had a very interesting discussion uh, uh, with Mr. Yusmadi from, from Malaysia, who talked about uh, Malaysian politics and Malaysian culture, right? And he made a very interesting uh, remark, which, I, which has stuck in my mind, that the Malay culture is actually postmodern. <laughs> wow, that was incredible. And then we have uh, Professor Wong, Wong from, uh, from NTU who talked about uh, the future of uh, uh, decarbonized energy, which uh, the use of hydrogen. And this is going to be a very major part of, of Singapore's energy uh, uh, mix. Uh, then we had Sudhir uh, from the, uh, the JOM uh, publication, right? He's a journalist and, uh, and also somebody who is very, very active in the social media. Uh, we had Tan Cheng Bok, who is the uh, of course, a former scout and uh, now a, a leader of a, a major political party, the Singapore uh, Progress Singapore Party. Uh, and then we had a whole list of other political figures. Uh, where Lim Tian, right? Uh, I, I briefed Lim Tian basically to talk about the legal uh, constraints of, of uh, uh, dissenting, dissenting views in Singapore. So we talked about the, the legal structure. Then uh, we had uh, uh, Leong Man Wai again. Uh, he was not talking about the, the politics, but, but I asked him to, to brief us about, you know, what are the constraints of discussions uh, in parliament itself? So, so this was a very technical discussion about, you know, uh, how, how do you conduct uh, discussions in parliament? Um, then, then, so these are some of the, the topics, and we had it in a Palms Bistro in town, right? Which had a accommodation of about maybe fifty to hundred people, and then uh, we decided that uh, we will now shift to, to Zoom. So that's just why uh, we are we are on Zoom. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, Zoom sessions we had was on Singapore's past, present, and future, right? Which were which were then recorded and then and then uh, posted on on. On uh, on YouTube, and it it received tremendous amounts of uh, interest uh, on on YouTube. Okay, so the topic for tonight, um, the the it is very important that that we in Singapore and those who are interested in the Sing in Singapore's future, right, must know themselves very well first before we are able to think about the the. the uh, things beyond Singapore, okay? So, the, the British had uh, inadvertently created a kind of a racial divide by, by creating the CMIO model, right? The Chinese, Malay, Indians, and others, that model, uh, with the intention of uh, uh, being fair in the legislations that affect the different uh, racial groups but inadvertently actually created the divisions between the, the different groups. And then we have this, uh, uh, we have this legacy, which we need to, to overcome. And I must say that uh, uh, the, the Singaporean identity, right, has emerged, uh, uh, I think, to a, to, to a larger extent than, than we had expected. Uh, there is a Singaporean identity. And this came about interestingly, because as, as Singaporean Chinese went back to China to visit, right, they found 
they found that uh, their, their Chinese nurse, the Singaporean Chinese nurse, very different from the China Chinese nurse, you know. So also the, the Indians who went back to, to India, the, the, in, the, the Singaporean Indian found himself to be quite different from the Indian Indians. Okay. And then you have the, um, the, 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 the Malays in Singapore, right? Who have come through the Malay, the, the Singapore kind of developmental model, the educational model, and so on, and they also sense that there is a difference between them and the and the Malays in in Malaysia. Okay, and of course we have the the the, the others, the Eurasians, and uh, I will leave that to uh, uh, oh. <laughs> uh Victor 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 Olson, right? To, to, to explain to us because there are so many kinds of Eurasians, right? He himself is a kind of Swedish uh, and uh, mixed between Swedish and, 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 and Malacca uh, Eurasian. So this is very interesting. So I think we are, we are in a situation in which we can now really look at ourselves critically. In the past, the, the government has been rather reluctant to, to have us publicly discuss our ethnic and racial identities for fear that... Uh, it may arouse uh, 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 sectionalism and factionalism and so on among the races. But I think we have reached a point in Singapore where we are much more, uh, uh, we have a certain unifying uh, identity, which is we, we roughly call the Singaporean identity. And so we are now in a position to be able to discuss this much clearer. So I will now uh, turn to uh, Mr. Balji, right? To, to explain to us. And Balji is, again, when we talk about Indian, there's so many kinds of Indians, right? And I'm particularly uh, 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 interested in the kind of uh, Indians that uh, come from Kerala, of which uh, uh, Balji comes from. And many of the top uh, 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 Indians in Singapore, in politics, in business, and so on, are from Kerala. Kerala is the most advanced, uh, in a sense, a, more, a very advanced uh, civilization, Indian civilization. So all, over to you, Balji. Thank you, King Ting. King Soon, sorry. Uh, this is going to be, when I started preparing for this, I told myself that, you all can hear me, right? Ken can hear. Yeah, okay. Uh, I told myself, you know, maybe the, the best approach to this is to start on a personal narrative and then mix it, the personal narrative, with issues that an Indian Singaporean like myself has confronted and is confronting. Okay, so I'll start by saying I'm 75 years old uh, with perhaps another five years to live. Uh, I was born in Kerala, uh, South India, a narrow strip of land, the south, narrow strip of land on the south, southern coast of India, South India. On the, on the west, it, is, uh, it faces the Bay of Bengal. On the east, it faces the western Ghats. A mountain range. It's a narrow slip of land. And I left, I left uh, Kerala at the age of one. So I was born in Kerala, but I left at the age of one uh, with my mother and in a ship, a journey that uh, took seven days at that time. That is 74 years ago. Today, that journey takes four hours by, sorry, by, by plane. It's just to show, not that you all are not aware, but just to maybe dramatically show that how times have changed, how things have changed. And in the same context, things have also not really changed. I'll come to that later. The, the big thing that happened for people like me, I lived in the in the former naval base, which was uh, uh, there were a lot of people from Kerala there, and and you know Kerala is it till today ruled by communists, the Communist Party of India, 
CPI. And there were a lot of people from Kerala who were there. And it was a kind of a, a, a place, a hotbed for what I would call, of what um, Mr. Lee Konyu would have called uh, people who are uh, out there to strike, which they did. My father was a labor union leader there, and he was, and he organized a couple of strikes. So I grew up in that environment where there was a lot of uh, political debate and uh, political arrests. People like Mr. Michael Fernandez, who was arrested under Internal Security Act, uh, uh, was, a, was a union official, a uh, naval base union official. So I, I, I grew up in that kind of an environment. And one thing that stuck in my mind, and, and it still sticks in my mind, is a kind of, I won't say it was a, a color blind, you know, but race was not a major factor. You know? uh, we used to go out and play with people of different races. Uh, when Deepavali comes, I have to go and give all the goodies to the, to the non-Indians' homes. So we, we had a good, in that sense, we had a very good life. But of course, it was a difficult period economically for us too, not, not just for us, for many Singaporeans. But then all those changed. I'm, I'm just being very brief here. The explosion of growth happened. You know? And it was not just in travel, but in nearly every uh, other area. Uh, I have written about this many years ago. I belonged at that time, I, I said I belonged to the lucky generation. The lucky generation where we, we suffered, but we also in the process uh, benefited a lot as salaries, housing prices, and CPF contributions, which was 25 to 25, 25 and 25, 25 by the employee and 25 by the employer, right? Which was a huge amount of money when you find, when I, when I finally retired, there was a, a huge sum of money available for people like me, you know? Uh, when I said that uh, uh, salaries and housing prices, I meant that it helped a lot of people, including me, to, to buy and sell, buy and sell, you know, houses. And, and we made quite, uh, decent money. But this is where I, I come to my, my, my main, uh, the, the thrust of my argument, but to say that how things have changed for me. As, as, I'm, as, my, uh, as, uh, as I get slower, when I walk, I'm, I'm slower now. Expenses have gone up, uh, and uh, population has gone up. I see more and more people now. Expenses going up. And I keep asking myself, and this is, uh, I, I'm here bearing my heart, is this a place I want to live in? And it has really not this decision this question that i'm asking is really nothing to do with race you know although some of my friends want to leave singapore because they feel that uh, indian singaporeans don't have much of a room to maneuver here i my experience is just the opposite you know? so my 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 uh, the thrust is is this the place i want to live in because it's become so crowded because it's become so expensive and uh, people have become uh, rude, if I can use that word, just today, you know, and I experience this nearly every day. I was at Junction 8, and there were these four or five young girls, school girls, coming on the opposite direction, coming to me. They didn't even bother that I was there walking, didn't even bother to give me some space so that I could pass through. And when I was uh, uh, got a bit angry 
and I said, excuse me, in a very stern voice, the girls were very upset, right? They didn't even know that what they did was wrong, not giving way to a much older man. So that's the question I ask, is this the place I want to live in? Uh, I, I now use this term quite often. The term is a squeezed nation. We are becoming a very, very squeezed nation when the, with the people jostling for space on the five-foot waist. And I see this and I experience this nearly every day. People don't give you way, don't give way. They walk to a stride. They walk towards you. And there's no space for me to move. So that is one. Uh, the roads are congested. The buses and trains are congested, especially during rush hours. And I have now reached a point where I'm seriously asking myself, should I go and live in Kerala? I go to Kerala every year. I've been going back and front up, up and down last 48 years. And I've seen great change in Kerala. Many of my friends think, cannot understand why I go to Kerala. I said, Kerala, is, I mean, don't, don't base your impression of Kerala from what you see on BBC or CNN. I mean, in, in, India is many nations in one country. You know? and Kerala is a very different country. Uh, I like it. Uh, and of course, it is not a perfect country. You know? there, are things, there are things in Kerala which I don't like. But at my age, I don't mind. I can, I can uh, tolerate that. No? And this thought of wanting to live in Kerala for a longer period, that doesn't mean I will migrate, but to live in Kerala, it hit me last January when I returned from a one-month trip to Kerala, when I landed in Changi Airport, I began to miss Kerala, which has never happened to me in the last 40 over years. I felt very sad. Uh, why Kerala attracts me? Space, of course, because... And when I meant space and I meant squeezed in Singapore and I talked about space, what I also didn't men what I didn't mention was I also mentioned I, I also think the political space is getting smaller and smaller. You know, although although the government says a lot of things and uh, there are more opposition in parliament, but it is getting I'm telling you it is getting smaller and smaller. You know? So why why uh, Kerala? Why Kerala attracts me? Space, of course. Uh, it's a very it's a very open kind of a society for me. Living cost, you know, with with my exchange rate of six one dollar to sixty rupees is great. Things are much cheaper. Uh, I've got a lot of friends there, both professional and personal. And I go back every year, so I, I meet more people, I make friends with more people. And of course, as, as, I, as, as I kind of hinted, uh, Kerala is not a bed of roses. I don't think you can find a, a place which is uh, perfect for anybody. You know? But I find that at this age, at 75, I find Kerala is one place that I can go and live longer there. You know? Okay, Balji. I think that uh, you you you've made a, you've made some very very important points, right? That the congestion of Singapore and also the rudeness, the cost of living, right? And also at our age, that uh, we are looking for a, a bit more uh, quiet place and more more uh, more space. So I think that uh, interestingly, what you say the the issue of race does not even occur anymore because I think. Singapore, in a sense, is now kind of spread, spreading its wings all over, right? I mean, I'm sure that even if you go back to Kerala, you will still come back to Singapore and, and because you have family here as well. So it's become a to and fro kind of situation, right? We are no longer this, this, 
we are no longer confined to this little red dot, but we are now seeing the bigger picture. So on that point, uh, uh, we will come back to discuss some of these points uh, later on. But but I like to move on to uh, Sarafian because uh, he has to he has to uh, have a break breakfast uh, pretty soon, right? So Sarafian, over to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Professor Taking Soon, for having me in this panel. Yeah, I think I have about 13 minutes to speak. But let me just uh, introduce myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Sarafian Saleh. I'm a pure mechanical engineer. Yeah, I've never thought of myself talking to you guys or doing some heritage works or being in humanity. But because of me looking for my identity, I started to go into the capo mode and start digging my the truth about who I am or who I was before. This is, this is the, the book that you wrote, right? The, the book is... So you know when you when you hear about the boogies in those days or even in the modern era, people always think of it as a shopping center or MRT station. So the identity has been lost totally. Even today, when I was doing my guiding tour for the schools, okay, I also do. I'm a mechanical engineer. I write books. No, I also do guiding. I do heritage guides. I do tourist guides. That's my passion. So so if I'm not doing my engineering work, I'll be doing guiding or I'll be doing writing. So for my engineering work, because I've got time, I've got time of, on my own. I run my own business for 22 years. So I have time to do my heritage, which I'm really passionate with. And that actually brought me to writing and preparing that book for over 15 years. And only last year, I launched it. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to share with you is actually my journey, my journey of identifying myself. Because I think uh, from identifying my journey, identifying my roots, it also brings back the Asian value uh, that has been lost in Singapore. So when I heard about Balaji and the five girls who knocked him uh, and he was really annoyed, I think there are some Asian values that has to be inculcated to all mm. of us, uh, yeah. be it any race, any, re any religion. But the Asian value is something that's very, very common to us. So the way, the way I grew up and the way my dad grew up or probably uh, Mr. Balaji grew up, the era is that there is a bit different. Maybe for, from... His era, he has faced challenges. He has faced the Raffles effect. When Raffles came to Singapore, he separated us. And this Raffles effect actually made us feel inferior amongst each other. The Malays don't know the Chinese, the Chinese don't know the Indians. So, so the couple spirit has been broken up by Raffles. So when Lee Kuan Yew led us, so when we gained full independence in 1965, when he led us, I think the first thing that he did good for us was to abolish this Raffles effect and let's live together. So that's that's where you know, the, this part of the CMIO exists, but he believed in us being equal eh, in, in a way. Eh? So that, that's where, that, that's where um, probably our parents still felt the differences. But for me, when I was born, when I went to a Catholic school, Catholic kindergarten, eh, Montfort and St. Paul's Church kindergarten, I found that everyone's the same. I don't know what's Chinese, I don't know what's Indian until we start to learn our different languages. So that's just one, one thing that I, 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 I grew to appreciate. Then come to my children, my two boys. They don't even know that there is this separation. Everyone's the same. So that, that's, that's wonderful. But when they have this bicentennial in 2019, right? When they want to commemorate Raffles' founding of modern Singapore. I think most of us locals were quite... Uh, frustrated. Agree, right? I mean, like, they say, the Chinese have been here before Raffles, the Malays have been here before Raffles, the Chola Empire has been here a thousand years before Raffles. So everybody was, like, quite upset. That's where they start to look for their own identity, which includes myself. So when I was looking for my identity, I realized that, hey, I'm a Bugis. Uh, you know, the Malay, the Malay, the Malay community, you have your own ethnic, sub-ethnic community as well, like the Hakas, the Hokkien's, the Cantonese, Teochew. So we Malays also have our own identity. And that led me to identifying my my roots. And I believe I believe one important thing that we have to really appreciate where we come from, especially where we are born, like in Singapore, is to find your roots. Because if, if you find your roots, you're able to tell why your forefathers chose Singapore as the place to live. 
why do they come here? They they brave the rough seas and they call this place home. So that's what I'm always trying to share with people whenever I have a chance to talk to the public about my book. I talk to the public about the history of Singapore no? from my perspective. So the first thing is that the first thing I always emphasize is your roots. And how to know about how to know your roots is to always construct a family tree. So when you construct a family tree, you know where you come from. And you know why your forefathers actually came to Singapore and they lived here. Okay? Say for, for us boogies, so we were big time sailors in those days. Okay, we, we came here uh, a thousand years ago no? and we start to sail, we start to do trading with the Chinese as our favorite counterpart. Now all this has been forgotten. You know, when, when I speak to even adults, like my like some somebody my own age, uh, when I ask them about the Bugis or the Javanese, they just say, oh, they are just generally Malays. So it, there's, there's nothing to cling on to to appreciate your culture. Because if you know your culture, you eventually love your country. It's just like the Pranakans, you know, the, 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 the Hokkien's, the Hakas, they have their own, their own clan house. Now all these clan house are built for a purpose. It's for them to understand who they, where they are, and where they come from. So for me, it's, it's, for me, when I embark on this journey of writing this particular book, you know, okay, I'm not promoting my book, but I'm just sharing with you. That's the only thing I can share about. It actually helps me to be aware of who I am and who my neighbors actually, are. Actually, uh, Sarafan, when I read your book, I learned a lot about about <laughs> Singapore, <laughs> oh, which I you. do not know, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, that was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Professor. You see, uh, uh, I I did speak to people like Professor John Mixick, Professor Peter Boschberg. Eh? I asked them, I'm going to write this history, you know, as, uh, Prof. Is it okay? Then he said, they, they said to me, uh, Sarafin, you are an engineer. You're not a historian. So even if there is an error or there is a certain uh, extrapolation of information that you feel it's it exists, eh? you won't lose your job. For, for them, they're historians, so they said, okay, whatever I've learned, this is what I'm going to present. For me, I'm, I'm an open writer, so I can just write. Of course, when I write, I write with basis. I write with logics, lots of research. I do lots of oral records. I, I interview those folks. I would say like a, almost a quarter of those I interviewed in my book has passed on. So before they pass on, I actually interviewed them. I got lots of stories about uh, old Singapore. And interestingly, I don't really get about the Boogies. I also learned about the Chinese. Okay, I learned about the Indians. I learned about the Eurasians or how they came here and how they lived together. It's it's wonderful. It's a wonderful template that you know I'm not selling for you, but then if this book actually makes you feel you're very Singaporean, you make it makes you feel that you you want to there's something for you to to cling on to. So when I whenever I go to Boogies Junction, I don't see any more Boogies people. Okay, this even some even some of my friends ask me, how does the Boogies look like? Does, does it look like this? No, they've, they've estimated amongst the, the population, but it's it's a history that you can cling on. No? So I always feel that the name Bugis in North Bridgewood uh, is something that I could cling on to. This part of me couldn't really find something, a real artifact or anything Bugis, but at least the name actually gives me a starter to, to speak about. So it's, it's really it's really, really very hard to for me to make people visualize, but you know, after you listen, after people listen to me for ten minutes, probably could people imagine with certain uh, uh the stories I've shared that yeah, the boogies they do exist. Okay, I mean percentage wise, uh, of the boogies they're only like zero point four percent of the Malay population. If you look at the Chinese, it's like for Chinese percentage Chinese that fifty percent Malays, right? Of that of that fifty percent, only zero point four are boogies. So it's really very little. But why the names the name Boogie is so huge? So there, there is a reason for that. So when I did my his, my research, I thought that it was really an entry port before in that area. Oh, okay, Sarafian, I I think uh, we 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 are, we are time time stress. Okay, right? okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I think you, you have made some very very important points, right? That the the Boogie's traders were actually working very closely with the Chinese traders. So this yes, is yes. a very it's in in fact it's a trading network that that operated the whole of Southeast Asia. And I yes, think that's yes, a very important aspect, which actually relates to Singapore, right? 
Yes. And your yes. point about raffles, uh, I I totally agree. You know, <laughs> I think, <laughs> the raffles effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, raffles. Uh, well, he was part of the British uh, uh, colonizing uh, mentality, right? We want yeah. to split the people, uh, divide the people, so I can co they can conquer conquer them. So we will come yeah. back to this uh, uh, issues that you have raised, right? Okay. So have a good breakfast. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll come back. And then come back and join us. Okay. Okay. I will join you back. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the next speaker is uh, is going to be uh, C.S. Chong, right? And um, this is uh, this is C.S. Chong's uh, very important book on on the different uh, 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 Chinese communities in Singapore, right? The Teochew Hakkas and the Hokkien's and the Cantonese. And so over to you, uh, uh, C.S. Thank you, Professor Tay. Um, I'll start uh, the in the days before. Raffles step, step foot on Singapore, and even before Francis Lake stepped foot on uh, Penang. It's quite complex, so I the first part, I'll just, uh, I made a short video um, to show you the relationships. Um, Shall I, shall I begin? Go ahead. Please. All right. So um, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Day and Alex, scouting me. Um, now, I, I thought maybe the perhaps the best way for me to share the topic of my interest would be to share about my growing up years. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the topic that I'm about to share relates to my journey trying to rediscover and somehow or other, where I am today, promoting uh, the concept of the Pranakan heritage uh, in, in, in Singapore. Um, you see, when I was much younger, I think I, I live in one of those last kampong eras, uh, Katong Jujet area, where my family would live in a zinc house. And during rainy seasons, uh, my entire house would be flooded with water. And I think... <laughs> Back then, my siblings and I, we, we kind of enjoyed the moment, but I think my parents had a miserable time tending to the waters dripping into the living room and all these things. Huh? But, but I think what's most important about the carefree life that I had was that, like what was being shared by uh, Sarafian, I think we, my siblings and I, we, we played with a lot of the neighbors around and we've never really seen race as a particular thing for us. Um, and I think during my growing up years in that kind of environment uh, led me to, you know, somehow or other, I think I spoke more English than my mother tongue. <laughs> so what happened was that I think um, I, I was a victim in the era where I think uh, Mandarin was really important in the uh, education uh, period. And um, I had difficulties excelling in the language. And so my parents had no choice but to find alternatives for me to, to um, pursue my education. So I left Singapore when I was about 12 years of age. And when I was in, when I was abroad, I think what gave me this curiosity to want to rediscover uh, what makes me or uniquely Singaporean or, or how, how shall I relate and share uh, my culture being Peranakan uh, was that, you know, when I was overseas, there were a lot of international students um, and Sorry, where did you go? Where did you go? Oh yeah, so I, I left Singapore to Australia. So I was in Melbourne. I lived there for about eight years. Um, I studied the uh, secondary school to the JC period and I, I kind of um, graduated my, I got my first degree there as a programmer. And uh, yeah, so anyway, my, my journey there led me to know a lot of international friends and they shared a lot about their culture. And one fine day, a Korean friend, my roommate, asked me, you know, well, so what is Singapore's culture? So back then, I was just about to turn 13 years old. And I, I got really curious and puzzled, you know, because, you know, our Chinese friends, they shared a lot about the Chinese culture. Obviously, I'm Chinese, but I think whatever they, they shared, I can't relate. So um, I got some difficulties sharing about my roots. And then eventually, through the curiosity that, uh, you know, that I had back in those days, uh, it led me to rediscover, uh, inquire, ask my family members, friends, and relatives, and then realizing my family, we have Pranakan heritage. So um, through, through this journey of understanding who the Pranakans are, 
Um, the gist is so that I, I cover it during the time frame. I hope that we have more time to discuss later on. Uh, so I'll just give you the gist is that I've discovered that the Pranakans are not a racial community. You cannot put two different races together and hope, you know, appears a unique race by themselves or ourselves, um, known as Pranakans. I think that goes the same for people who are uh, associate themselves being Eurasians, you know, they're, they're prodigy. There's British and, you know, I think somehow miraculously they marry Asians and they're known as Eurasians. So I think um, there's something more, you know, there's something that I think we have to delve deeper into to understand that race is not about a formation of, you, you cannot have two races marrying each other and you get a new race by itself. So the gist is that the Pranakan culture is not about the marriage of races or different races, but largely about the marriage of different cultures. So if we can understand the gist of where I'm trying to get at, I believe that Pranakans, you know, if you translate it literally, uh, it will just mean locally born descendants of foreigners. Uh, we, we are living in a migrant society. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that, you know, with, with uh, got ourselves involved with, I think um, uh, Sarafian kind of shed some glimpse into it is that we, we've been divided. We have been constantly being reminded that we are different. Um, and I think inherently, I think we know that we are inherently different in many ways. But I think what's more important for us to delve into will be to understand that why not let's focus on the common grounds that we have, the common way of life that we can possibly share. Uh, and through that, I would suggest that the Pranakan culture tells a lot of that. Um, you know, there are Indian Pranakans. There are also Pranakans who are of Malay heritage, the Chinese Pranakans. And very recently, you know, I've, just, I, I've seen a glimpse of C.S. Chong's slide earlier about Quanzhou. I just came back from Quanzhou. And are you aware, or I'm not sure if you guys are aware, that there are Pranakan communities in Quanzhou also? So there's a whole history about how our, our Chinese forefathers came down to Southeast Asia, influenced the region, and somehow or other this culture that we practice being Pranakan was kind of brought back to China and, and the community in Quanzhou, they're still practicing the Pranakan heritage, but not a lot of us are aware of it. Um, so anyway, the, the, the gist of what I hope I can, you know, if there's anything that you all can take away from is that I, I, I love gardening, you see. So I, I used to use gardening terminologies a lot to, to help frame my, my concept uh, of, of sharing, um, you know, like permaculture and mycelium network. You know, something very interesting about the mycelium network would be, you know, if a, a, a stub of a tree, a tree would fall in a forest, somehow or other, you would imagine that you would see that the tree would be dead. But apparently because of the mycelium network, the stub, that the tree of it that has fallen continues to thrive over centuries uh, because different rooting system in the forest uh, ecosystem continues to provide nutrients to the stub, you know? So my concept is like, why not let's not continue in this venture to have this constant reminder that we are different, but continue to establish common grounds so that even, you know, a foreigner who comes and perhaps want to be a PR or citizen in Singapore, we can't possibly blame them for not being able to assimilate to our way of life. Singaporeans ourselves, we are not sharing enough and, and not knowing enough about what makes us Singaporean. Is it the food that we eat? Is it the language that we speak? I think there's a lot of uh, topic of concern that we can delve into. There's too much of, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can discuss. And I don't think time would allow us to do so. But really, if, if there's anything, the mycelium network is great. It gives us this concept that all of us, we have a role to help contribute in this society. Singapore must thrive. It should continue to flourish, not because of you know, the, in, the intention to, to subdivide us and remind us that you know of the racial riots, this and that. Obviously, that's part of history. We cannot yeah. discount that. Okay, I, mean, I, I, I think uh, we are short of time also. Right, but right. Your, your, the, the most important takeaway that you have given us is the mycelium network, which implies <laughs> that all of us share a, a share in the complexity of the root system on which we live.
on Vision Bypass. I think that's a very important concept, right? We'll come back again to that. Thank you. Now, I, I believe CS Strong is now ready. Um, okay, I think the, the video, the audio for the video clip is uh, not working through Zoom. So I'll, I'll leave it. Um, you can watch it on your own. But the, but um, I just want to bring up something uh, new, which I I I um I I have uh, the impressions I have from listening to the three speakers in front. Huh? Now the Chinese and um, the Chinese came to, to from China to um. Am I, am I see? Okay, okay. The Chinese came in from from China to Malaysia. All right, they had they I think the, and the population grew. Um, when they came to Singapore, when they came to the Straits uh, settlement, Singapore, Penang, um, Pen Malacca, if they're born in if they're if they're born in these areas, they are subjects of the the subjects of Britain, the Queen of Britain or the King of Britain. But if they're born in Malaysia, all right. They, there's there's no nationality for them, so in the, so they expected to kind of go back to go back to China or what or whatever. Um, so at at the time when Malaysian gained independence in 1957, 75 percent of the Chinese were born in Malaya. All right, 20, 20, 25 of them were came from China or, or from somewhere else. Now a lot of the a lot a lot of Chinese who have grown up in Malaysia and Singapore are very poor. They are squatters. They have no home of their own. They have no jobs, especially after the Second World War. They have no. Uh, some of them are starving. So that's the reason why they won the revolution. That's the reason why they won the uh, co communism. So the communism is not just the uh, the Malaysian. Uh, NPC and Malaysian Party of Malaysia is also in Singapore because Singapore may not be um, openly communist, but they are engaged in the trade unions. They were they are striving to get you know equal rights. So the the Chinese, um, at least the Malaysian the Malaysian Chinese, uh, um, values about communism is actually food in the stomach and a place to sleep. It's not like Kerala com communism where it's idealism. I mean, you know, it, it's quite different. Um. Yeah, I think I think I think that's what I want to share. Okay, that's more. Okay, all right. So 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 the the British knew that they can never, uh, never, uh, take, can never hold on to to Malaya. They gave Malaya independence. All right, even before Singapore, they gave Malaya independence in nineteen fifty seven, so that um, they can, um. Uh, so that they have, they have a they have a basis for fighting the fight for fighting the communists because it, it, they are now it's now between the Chinese and the fight is now between the Chinese and Malay now. Let me see the the Chinese communist. No, no. Um. Okay. The the Malaysia is now owned by the Malays, the kings, right? And the Ch and Chinese when they if they are going for a revolution to be fighting against the kings of the Sultans instead of fighting against the the British. So that was the rational for the British giving um, away Malaysia. But they wanted to keep uh, Singapore uh, for their own. But I think um, the, the Singaporeans, Lee, Lee, um, Lee Kuan Yew and, and, and David Marshall and all, uh, wanted, wanted independence. Yeah. OK, CS, so yes, um, can you just briefly uh, uh, elaborate on who were the the Chinese, that that I mean, there were there were Hokkien's, there were Teochews. Well, let me put it in another way. The the Malayan Communist Party members, I believe, were were mainly led by Hakka uh, Chinese as well as Ainanese Chinese, right? The the Hokkien's are already busy doing their business, and the the the, uh, the, the Cantonese for the mining business, and and so on. So. They were already deeply involved in the economy, whereas the other groups, the Hakas and the and the and the and the uh, uh, Hainanese, were more disadvantaged. So were, were they the ones that were more active in the communist party? Okay, um, the the people who want change is all over. 
all, all over Malaya, Malaya, both in Singapore, Singapore and the, the, the peninsula Malaya. Malaya. Uh, in Singapore, it's of course, obviously, it's the poor people, the rich, the rich, the rich um, pullers and all these people, people uh, the prostitutes and all this. Um, to one, one one change. change. All right. So this can this can be Hokkien or Teochew or whatever. The, the 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 poor the poor. I mean they are they are poor Teochew poor Hokkien in Singapore. Not just wealthy merchants. Same in Penang. Same in KL. Now and then there are there are squatters. There are squatters in Singapore. There are squatters in Penang. All right. These are these are urban squatters. All right. So these are mainly Hokkien and so on. Now um so they would be um pressing for change. Trade, uh, trade unions and so on, not going calling for strikes in Singapore. Now the the Hakas were general. They in the past they were uh, miners, so they live in Ipoh, they live in uh, um, Taipei and all this area. Peraga. Uh. Now Ipoh has got the, a lot of Hakas and and Hakas, uh, and this Ipoh. Um, the, there are there are a lot of hakas. I think the population for the Kinta Valley was about 200, 200 over thousand in uh, at the end of the war. Ipo itself is a, almost a hundred thousand. All right, so they have no property rights at all. They are squatting on land, and next to the Kinta Valley is actually Cameron Highland. So it's just it's where the Communist Party operates, right? So and the and the Kinta Valley itself is is all limestone, not lots of caves, places to hide. So the British has a big headache, to, but how, not how to how to keep the uh the Hakka people in Ipoh and the, the surrounding Kinta Valley away from the 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 Communist Party. So they form, they built new villages, right? They built new villages, they fence up, they fence up this these people, and then making them uh uh. Uh, keep them on surveillance to come in and out. All right, Chin Peng, Chin Peng is actually uh, a Hokkien, uh, but he's not a Minan. Uh, he's actually Fu Chou, Hok Hok Chiu like you call Hok Chiu. So so it's it's not that um um uh ha ha only the Hakas are, are communists. It's, it's all over except that uh, Hakka happens to be um in Ipo, which is very close to the communist uh. Area in, in the on the Cameron Highlands and the new villagers, a lot of them were uh were were, were affected were affected uh, by the new villagers when the British uh, created that 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 the BRICS policy. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, CS. Uh, I think you brought a whole new dimension to the issue of uh, race and and uh, uh, ethnic identity among the Chinese, right? And that your point, and I think it's a very important point, is that. The the political uh, 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 activism of of the of that period of under the British was driven by uh, basically dis economic disadvantages that were imposed by by poverty and by uh, dis uh, social disadvantages, right? And therefore, uh, the gravitation towards the uh, 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 the arms struggle. As well as the the uh, constitutional struggles within trade unions and so on and so forth. So that is the political dimension of the of the of the Chinese uh, of that period, and that is and that cuts across all the different ethnic groups within within China. It's a class conflict issue. Okay, so we will come back again to that. So now I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, uh, 